Marina has been doing very well. Congratulations, Marina. And that's exactly what I've been asking people to do. Find a specialty, focus on it. Marina is an expert in the Great British Pound. Fantastic. Good job. So welcome to Forex Dot today for our live Forex trading webinar. Let me remind you that trading is risky, not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results. So it's a pretty good idea to stay small and stay humble, focus on the long term, and never risk money you cannot afford to lose. My name is Wayne McDonald. I'm the Chief FX Market Strategist for Traders Way, an ECN that gives you access to Forex, to energies, to metals, to indices, and more for your success and trading pleasure. Let me uh, let you in on a secret here. This is our, our business model, our, our business plan. What we're doing is we do these educational and strategy events because Trader's Way wants you to become a successful Forex trader that can trade profitably for years and years and years and years. We hope by investing into your future success today that when you are ready, when you are comfortable, when you do have skills to apply to the market, that you don't choose Trader's Way as your broker. And we form a business partnership. Like I said, you trade successfully for years and years and years to come, and uh, Trader's Way will execute your trades for you. Pretty simple, pretty profound, but we hope you pay it back. Hey, you're at Forex Dot today. You can come to the website, and there's at least a dozen trading ideas posted by the uh, analyst staff. Many of the analysts have been um, trading under my tutelage for years, so they're very uh, they're very knowledgeable, skilled people that are spending the time to think about the markets, to review their charts, to come up with trading ideas and spend another hour documenting all the different screenshots and writing out their thoughts and posting them. So you can imagine maybe 30 hours. Ah, well, let's say 24. There's about 24 hours worth of solid work put into Forex Dot today every single day. Perhaps you can um, take advantage of some of that thought, whether you agree with it or not. It's still interesting thoughts. And then you should uh, leave a comment. Give some feedback to the uh, staff. You can also uh, go up here to where it says webinars, and you can re register to attend these live sessions that I do every single weekday. Be nice to see you online. So let's get to the charts, huh? British Pound. Did Mark Carney and the Monetary Policy Committee at the uh, at the Bank of England did they raise interest rates today? No. Did they lower interest rates today? No. Was there any significant changes in in the uh, statement? Inflation forecast, okay. What are we talking about? Let's get specific. Yeah, we're missing the CPI numbers. And uh, they need a little more time. I guess what's happening is... Um, we, we've we've the the big crash in oil prices and other commodities, in particular oil, was about a year ago, 
And they probably only budgeted a year for that, right? They were probably thinking, well, fourth quarter of last year was the big crash. Well, oil prices will have stabilized and risen within a year was probably the thought process, right? Well, it'll be, uh, oil prices will be back up next year. Well, next year has, has come. <laughs> next year's knocking on the door. Hello! And next year says, oil prices are still exactly the same. Okay? So we're going all the way back to my thought process from a year ago. And what that was is that the bad first quarter numbers out of GDP out of the UK. So you got to go back to first quarter of last year and you know and then of course even the year before it was the same where the first quarter was really bad, right? And since then, things have been less bad, dare I say, actually improving. So one thing that may happen is that bad data is going to be dropped off and replaced with better data, and that's going to happen, I said, in the first quarter. That still looks good to me. Doesn't it actually look smarter now? Because I think what's going to happen is we're going to get awesome GDP, in the first quarter, which means a second quarter rate hike out of the Bank of England. But we've already, I've already done a video on that, right? I've already done a half an hour presentation on why I thought that would be the case. So that doesn't seem to be too far off right now. So um, cool, right on. Now, didn't Carney also seem to think that the British pound was overvalued? Did, any, did anybody get that? No? I thought he felt it was overvalued. All right, well, maybe that's just me. So cool. Are the charts okay? Can you see the charts fine? Yeah, right. Cool. So I get a tingly feeling. And the tingly feeling is this. I think the Bank of England is going to raise rates, let's say, like by June. So somewhere in the next seven months, I need to build a portfolio. Cool. So declines are awesome. I love declines. Because I think eventually it's going to go up. So if you go back to what we were doing, uh, I don't know, I guess a month ago, remember these, these gray zones were places I would like to buy if I get a retracement and a reversal pattern. I think the, you know, I think they're still reasonable places. The question is, do I buy the British pound today? Do I buy the pound yen today? Hmm. That feels kind of risky to me, doesn't it? Now, this is the tricky part. Do you try to catch the falling knife? So, yeah, probably not. But you do have this school of thought, right? Like a bear sold that. I think if you're going to be conservative, you're going to look for this and bring it down to the next level, right? And I, I, like, I, I like the fact that it's bouncing here at 86. Because, well, it's supposed to.
In typical pound yen, I remember looking at this. Man, it's at 86. Look at that, 86. It's at 86. Oh, nice round number. It's at 86. How nice. I should buy it. I should buy it. I should buy it. And then, like, oh, I don't know. I went and got a new cup of coffee, came back, and it was at 86.70. <laughs> I'm like, don't. Missed it. Have you ever had that problem with pound yen? I have. You sneezed and it moved 70 pips. Whoops. So anyways, it's back here. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, whoever bought it at 86 has made 50 pips already. Yeah, but it took 25 minutes. That's why they call it the beast. So anyways, cool. Um, pound Aussie, pound dollar. So you got to mark up your charts, right? Just to remind yourself where we are where we've been, where we're going. Yeah, why not? Back out, let's add some more time. Yeah, it seems pretty fair to me. Yeah, so I wonder how long it's going to take before this does become bullish again. This says grow cautious, doesn't it? Okay. Somebody requested pound kitty cat. Oops. Uh, sure, why not? That's why they call it pound cat. Pound a kitty cat. Kitty, kitty, kitty. Oops. Well, why don't we just change the template? So there we are. Pound CAD. Okay, the thing with this pound CAD deal is that lack of inflation in the UK is bad for global macroeconomics. And when it's bad news for global macroeconomics, commodity currencies usually don't enjoy it. Because a major economy like the UK is just really not online. It uh, it's, doesn't have a ton of money to spend on things. Right? So that, that could be generally bad for countries that are supposed to be exporting. So, uh, you know, I don't know if I'd trade pound CAD on this. Now you, now you see pound CAD coming down, but it has nothing to do with CAD. That's everything to do with British pound. So if the UK is doing bad, are you bullish on the Canadian dollar? Is that it? And I don't know if I follow that. So that's the thought process that I have for it. Okay, so for whoever asked for the pound CAD. Mm, all right. And uh, I'm already exposed to a commodity currency. So I don't know if I want to go again on another one. So here's a four-hour chart. So here's that um, Aussie yen. Okay. Now it looks like it's starting a new cycle, doesn't it? 
2155 cross, pull back, maybe a 5A cross with the Stoke cycle. Syrup, I didn't like pound CAD because negative global macroeconomic data put that's weakening the CAD or weakening the Great British pound on the long run is going to weaken the CAD too. So I'm bearish on both. That's why. So how many people would agree that this looks like it has a pretty good chance of heading up to the next level? By the next level, what I mean, obviously, is weekly M4. How many people look at that and say, yeah? OK. So I'm in at, what, 85 and a half, 85, 70, actually. So why don't I lock in, um, oh, what is that, about 80 pips? Yeah, 80 pips exactly, 800 and a half, 80 and a half pips. So I just locked in 80 pips profit. Let's make it 75. Whoop, what the hell did I just do? Ugh. I think one of my keys is stuck. Delete and limit. All right. So the worst I can do on this trade is 75 pips. <laughs> I only made 75 pips. Let it run. And obviously, this could have been an opportunity to add a second lot to the position as well, right? And for those that like oscillators, a little early. Actually, it's supposed to be based on when it re-enters, right? So the re-entry is still there. Still early, but you have to look at this like, all right, that happened at New York close, Asia open, London open. So you just sort of had to time it with new money. One thing I often ask myself, especially if I'm trading at the end of the New York session, or even at the end of the London session, and I think something's going to go up, I ask myself, well, who's going to... Who's going to come into the market now and buy it? Like, where's the new money going to come from, right? And very often I'll say, ooh, all right. I don't see new money coming in until at least Asia. So I'll throttle back my aggressiveness and just say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't want to be the only one in this trade. I kind of need the rest of the market to be with me, right? Okay. Now you could look at this from like a 15 minute view and try to grab some cycles that way. So like we know here, right, this orange line, that's the stochastics on the hourly chart saying, all right, boys, let's give it a shot. So on the smaller time frames, you take the next cycle. You take a shot here, and you take a shot here. Remember, at the whole time, the hourly is just starting an up cycle. So the hourly is trying to do this, right? So if you have that going, then these are buying opportunities that you want to put together. Okay. Now, what about a double bottom? What do you do here if you were watching this on the hourly since yesterday?
This is where you drop into a five minute chart. Right there. Because you could see bullish engulfing candle, Fibonacci retracement, higher high, higher low, roll reversal, higher high, higher low. There's lots of trades in there, man. There's like four or five trades. If you're a scalper and there's, you know, a lot of people start with really small short term time frames, but I always set my short term trades up with longer term patterns. Longer term could even just be like an hourly pattern like this, right? <clears throat> and you could say to yourself, you know, um, once you have a double bottom established, you know, all of these things are trade opportunities. Okay. Okay, so for example, you're waiting for the double bottom. There it is. What do you do now? Right? You're going to fib this, right? Then what? Well, then we have this resistance area, don't we? So what's the next step? Our high. Now what do you do? So on and so forth. Now, if you're really scalping, <clears throat> look at all these other things. You know, there's lots of these moves. You can do this all day. It's a lot of work. Okay. And now maybe we'll, we'll get a little fib retracement and then try that again. Okay. Now these little moves, I probably wouldn't trade a yen pair just because the spreads are too high and you know there's just you're 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 trying to survive off crumb. But you know for a very you know the, let's say for a currency pair with very 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 small spreads, uh, euro dollar, uh, USD yen, uh, then yeah you could even trade those little one minute moves, right? Just pick up the five pips here, five pips there. Um, it's not my style, but certainly can be done. Okay, but just again, the way that I start is I start on, let's say, the hourly chart and I say, all right, I think, you know, in the next 12 hours, it's going to turn bullish. Then you drop to a 15 minute chart and you now you have your pattern at support in the direction you want to go, right? You've had the retracement. And then even on smaller time frames, and you could trade the double bottom. So you could long the double bottom. You can grab the pullback, the breakout, the retracement, and the extension. Could be a rabbit, could be, right? There's trades there, my friend, right? <clears throat> but what I was saying is this could have been an opportunity somewhere in here, one of these, to add a second swing trade. They're not just, you know, 15 minute setups or five minute setups. You know, this could be something that we waited four days for. And now you have, I, I could have two positions with trades at break even instead of one. Okay. So if I was going to trade a commodity currency, I'd do it that way. You want to hear a, a sad but true story?
I longed CAD Yen, what was it, two days ago? Right about here. <laughs> That's why I get it. It wasn't a very good trade. I was a little late. Paid the penalty. You can see my plan. And uh, that's what you get for poor entries. So I was up at some point about, I don't know, 50 pips, something like that. And it came back, knocked me out yesterday, and it was back up. Don't! Oh! That's, there you go. So the question is, why CAD Yen from a fundamental view? Um, all right, well, first of all, I did cover it in great detail yesterday or the day before, so you could watch that video, because uh, we actually planned this, and then I took it, right? Um, but it had to do with if you thought oil was going to continue up from 46. So I think we actually had the oil chart up on one side, CAD Yen on the other um, and we were going to play them as a correlated trade, perhaps. And then, um, and this was when we were down here at 46, and we were going to get a breakout to the upside, maybe. And that the other part of it is, if I thought that would happen, the Canadian dollar would get strong, but there's no way in the world I would sell U.S. dollar. So I don't want to sell USD CAD. So therefore, I might as well pair it up with another currency that I am fundamentally bearish on, which th that would be, for example, Japanese yen. So if we get an upside breakout on oil, I would trade the CAD yen. We got an upside breakout. I made 50, well, I had 50 pips at CAD yen. Moved my stop at break even. And for me, break even is minus one. So I think I lost one dot, right? One, uh, one pip. And then look, oil came straight down, and guess what happened to my CAD yen? Amazing, huh? It's almost the same chart. Yeah, John Howell's like, yeah, good plan, just didn't work out. Yeah, well, that's why you don't bet everything on one trade, <laughs> right? So, you know, what's the mantra? Buy at support, move your stop to break, break even, get another trade. Buy at support, move your stop to break even, find another trade. Buy at support, move your stop to break even, find another trade. After a year of doing this, you could have 40 trades open. You might have made a thousand trades. Well, not a thousand. Uh, you know, make, let's say you make two a day, ten a week, forty a month, four hundred, so five hundred trades a year. What if ten percent of your trades um, stay open? Because, like, for example, let's go back to the Aussie trade. Maybe that Aussie trade. What if that Aussie, what if that is the bottom? Like, what if that stays long? Let's go to a daily chart or something. Okay. What if we do work our way up? Global macroeconomics improve and, and the yen continues to weaken because right now this is still a yen story. What if price gets above that area. Let's get rid of this vert. Come on, vert. That's not it. Must be here, maybe? Wow. It's a magical vertical line. Can't be touched. Uh huh. I will not give up. You can go this way. Object list. 
Mm-hmm. I think it's labeled vertical line, isn't it? No. Trend line. Huh. Phantom vertical line. All right. Um, so let's do it this way then. What if? What if this big drop in the Kiwi dollar? Remember, this coincides with the USD, the Aussie USD, double bottoming at 69 and 70. So what if that's the floor? Then we get this big rise, slight higher high, but we haven't tested the previous low yet. Comes down, and look, I longed it right there. What if this happens now over the next two or three months? It's possible, isn't it? And re remember basic macroeconomic data. If the, if the domestic rate in the United States, if the domestic interest rate in the United States is higher than the world rate, then it will, it will create a propensity for Americans to buy more with their currency because foreign goods relative to U.S. goods will seem cheaper. So maybe they start importing more and exporting less. I don't mean to go Harvard on you, but maybe that happens. And uh, I don't know. That, that's, that weakens the yen and strengthens the Aussie at some point. Who knows? Right? Because if you look at the loanable funds market, um, if the dollar has a higher interest rate than the yen, the dollar would not be a good funding currency anymore because that rate would be higher than the yen rate. So anyone that wants to fund a carry trade would no longer use the, uh, the US dollar if they were. I mean, they were before when there was quantitative easing. But now there's even less likelihood so that they would just now borrow yen and weaken the yen more, that, so, so on and so forth. China container freight would be a good leading indicator. Bob's, I use um, the Baltic Dry Index. I track that uh, every day. It's super, super low right now. Okay. The Baltic, what? Wow. This is going to be one of those days, guys, where you're like, it's so nice to know what I don't know. But now I know I don't know, so now I'm going to learn how to know. All right, this is the Baltic Dry Index. Would you say that's a downtrend or an uptrend? Down. That's for this month, guys. Just this month. Well, what about a year? Oy vey, we were at 1,200 and it dropped to 600. Does that seem like approximately a 55.12% decline? <laughs> uh, let's go out even farther. What? Are you telling me a year ago or 18 months ago? The index was at 2,000-something? Where is this? 2,300. It was 2,300. It is 600. Holy smokes. Now, I don't know about you, but the, something that used to be, let's say, $2,300 is now $600. It feels kind of like a bad trend, right? So what is this? If you're, let's say, an importer, you're China, and you need to buy some iron ore and coal, 
What happens if you melt your iron ore and you sprinkle some coal dust on the top? What is it that you've made? When you're smelting, an unfort unfortunate smelting accident. Yeah, you make steel. That's how you make steel, guys. Melt some iron ore, sprinkle in some coal, boom! You got some steel. Yeah, but you can also burn the coal and create heat and electricity with it. And I don't know what else you do with iron ore besides make steel. Make something out of iron, I guess. Um, so that's that. So let's say you need some. And Australia is nearby, and it's got fantastic coal. Man, Australia's coal, best coal in the world. Beautiful stuff. Yeah, well, you have to get your own crafting table, Wyatt. So, so anyways, best coal in the world, iron ore, I guess, I don't know if you can have good or bad iron ore, but Australia has tons of iron ore. So, okay, good. So, you, you buy some of it. How do you get it to China from Australia? How do you actually move it? You have to realize we actually live in a physical world. It's not all charts, right? A ship. A boat. <laughs> you guys are so funny. A boat. No, no. A boat is made out of plastic. A ship is made out of steel. Come on! See, if I owned a yacht, man, I couldn't invite you on if you called it a boat. I'm like, what boat? I don't have a boat. I have a yacht. <laughs> I have friends with yachts, so I don't need to buy one. Uh, so, a very, very large boat, <laughs> for lack of a better word, a large boat that holds aggregate like iron ore and coal or whatever, you know, it's a hopper, a hopper ship. And you got to move this iron ore across the ocean, right? Now, there, there's only so many ships available. Well, it's not cargo, right? It's not cargo. That's different. Cargo would be a container stacked on top of another container with another container above it, and off it goes. And it's a container is filled with Bart Simpson t-shirts. It's filled with uh, beach chairs. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm talking about a specific ship that will only hold stuff like iron ore and coal. Okay? Right. Bulk. So, they're bringing this back to China, but there's only so many ships available. Well, now a tanker, I believe, would be liquid, right? But anyways... There's only so many ships available. Now, when not many of these purchases are being made, there's going to be a surplus of ships. There's going to be a lot of shipping companies that just have ships anchored at sea doing nothing. When there's, when there's only a few orders and lots and lots of supply of ships, what happens to price? Demand is low, supply is high. What happens to price? All right. I mean, let's, come on. Let's, you guys, you know, like, come on, Wayne. Do, do it right, Wayne. All right, hang on. All right, the variable, I suppose, is <coughs> cost. So the demand curve is shift sloping down, right? <clears throat> when cost is high, demand will be low. When price is low, demand would be high. So this is demand. And the, okay, and this is ships, I guess. Whatever. All right, and then supply is going to be this way, right? Equilibrium price. All right, so <clears throat> what if you increase demand? What if the, 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 the amount of ships 
is exactly the same, but all of a sudden orders for iron ore and coal double overnight. Suddenly China needs to stockpile and a whole bunch of orders come in. Does the demand curve shift or does the supply curve shift? Demand, does it shift left or right? No, right. So you move, it goes here. Because this is quantity, right? That, okay, that, so what happens is the old, right, this is the old demand. So you had this many ships before, Q1. Demand increased, so the demand, this is Q2. And what happens to price now? This is price one, and now price two. Okay, so prices went up as demand went up. So on and so forth, right? You could shift the supply of ships, ships and all that kind of stuff. So anyways, long story short, Um, look at the Baltic Dry Index. That's not good. And, and now, in this context, think of the Australian dollar. Because guess what? Iron ore and coal just happens to be the two largest exports out of Australia. So one theory is if the Baltic Dry Index is falling, the Australian dollar certainly isn't going up. Because remember, when China buys Australian iron ore and coal, they can't do it with renminbi, RMB. They can't do it with the Chinese yuan, right? What do they have to do? Enter the foreign exchange market, buy some Aussie dollars, and then with their Aussie dollars, buy iron ore and coal. So if they're buying iron ore and coal from Australia, Australia, um, the Australian currency should go up with increased demand. As we can see, when demand increases, prices rise based on the supply and demand curves. So if you buy a bunch of iron ore and coal from Australia, you're going to have to take it home somehow, right? You're not going to you know, put it in your carry-on, get on a plane, right, and with your iron ore and coal that you just bought. So you're going to need to ship it home. So this could be an interesting statistic to watch. Historically, do we seem to be at the bottom? I can't get you more than five years. So uh, very interesting. So use a, a particular Chinese index. Uh, I'm looking at this, you know, just commodities in general. Okay. So that's the Baltic Dry Index. It's actually the price of renting the 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 ship, the bulk dry goods ship to move something. That's the index of the prices, and they change every day. Isn't that neat? Well, what happens when you get to new lows, guys? Because Ron says headed to, for new lows. What happens is there's no reason to keep your ships sitting there idle, mothballed, doing nothing. At some point, you've got to maintain them because they're just sitting out somewhere rusting. So you take your oldest ships and you scrap them. At least, you know, you get rid of the ship. It's not a liability anymore. And you maybe you pick up some money because you scrapped it. And now the supply of ships goes down. What happens to price? 
if demand stays the same, but there's half as many ships, well, Ron's scrap prices are down. Yeah, but it's a little bit of money in your pocket now is better than spending money on your rusted out boat. And then when you do need to fire it up, it's old. It's rusted. You got to clean it up. You got to paint it. You got to you got to tune the engines. So what you could do is you could take the oldest part of your fleet, scrap it so it no longer costs you money. You put some cash in your pocket. And then when demand goes back up, well prices go back up, one of the two. And when the supply of ships goes down, the price should go back up. And then when demand picks up again and there's half as many ships, prices will skyrocket back to 2,000 as they've done in the past. And then what can you do? Order a new, modern, efficient ship with better hauls, more efficient engines, cost less to run, probably cheaper insurance, all that kind of stuff, and now you have a much more modern um, fleet. And so there are actual people that track this entire industry, the, the supply and demand curves of, ship, of the shipping industry, and would trade commodities based on that. Okay. Now, I want your specialty to be, you know, reading reports at central banks, so on and so forth. I've heard of people tracking the migration patterns of el African elephants and trading commodities based on that. Really, Imad, you don't, you don't know why that FXCM stock is so low? Well, just let's look at your statement, first of all. You say, why is FXCM stock so low? Is it good to buy it? Well, if you don't know the answer to that, then the answer is no. <clears throat> okay, so if you don't know, it, no, it's not a good... You buy something because it's undervalued, not because it's cheap. Well, who owns the stock? I mean, just forget it. If you don't know, yeah, just if you got to have an alpha, guys. You don't just buy something because it's cheap. So, anyways, uh, why the African elephants? Because if they have to migrate farther, so the elephant says to himself or herself, "Who? I, it's a matriarch." Uh, society, isn't it? Anyways, the African elephants, they start moving early in the year for water, and they travel farther for the water. What does the elephant know? The elephant knows that the rain isn't coming. The elephants know no rain is coming. There's going to be a drought. Do you think that can affect commodity prices? So now all you have to do is string it together with analysis. If there's a drought in the area of Africa where elephants migrate freely, and they are migrating a long distance for water, that means there's a drought. So in that area of Africa, <clears throat> when there is a drought, or when there is a drought, what tends to happen in places like Canada and the Ukraine and Australia that produce wheat? Or what happens to Brazil that produces coffee and soybeans? What happens to Belgium that produces uh, sugar beets? Okay, all you have to do is know that. What's the correlation? What happens to 
um, yields of grapes in Chile, in France, in Napa Valley, in Italy. What happens to these places? All you have to know is the cause and effect, the correlation. What happens? Is, is there too much rain in France? Buy some um, Chateau Neuf de Pop futures. Is there a drought in Australia? Buy some wheat. And you might find that that's going to actually be good for Australian wine. And so maybe you're going to have a vintage year. So maybe buy those, buy some wine futures there. I mean, just cause and effect. Just figure it out. It's easy. I sit down with my children. My children are young. I sit down with them and say, all right, the United States has to kill a bunch of egg-laying chickens because of a disease that came out. How do we make money on this? You just think it through, right? So if you only knew if there's a drought in Africa, what happens those years? When, so go back 50 years of, of weather data. When there's a drought in Africa, and that Africa, and the, and the elephants have to migrate farther distance for the water, so now even the even the elephants know there's a drought coming. How does that affect other variables, and how can you get into that before everybody else? Linda follows up at the FXCM stock buy thing. First of all, I'm not your financial advisor. You don't pay me any money. You haven't signed any disclosure documents or anything, so I don't know about your situation and all that kind of stuff. But if you don't know why the price is low and you don't have a catalyst for why the price is going to go back up, then you shouldn't buy the stock. So I, I, uh, I, I did a quick discussion a, a few days ago about how a billionaire makes his billions. And what he does is he goes into a market, becomes a, an expert in everything you could possibly know about a market. So, for example, if you don't know everything there's, you could possibly know about a retail forex as an industry, I mean, literally, you, all the companies in the whole market and the whole industry, and then you shouldn't get into it. This is now not my advice, the advice of the billionaire, self-made billionaire. So the self-made billionaire goes into an industry and then learns everything you could possibly know about that industry. Might spend two years just learning about the industry. Then they look at every single company and they, they look at the balance sheet, they look at the cash flow statements, they look at everything, the annual reports, they go through it and they break everything down and they place a realistic valuation on the company. They actually crank out the numbers, come up with the value of the, every company now that in that industry, and they find ones that seem to be undervalued based on the stock price to what they believe the company would be worth if they had gone out into the market and actually bought the entire company. That's how they think. If we bought the entire company today, what would we have to pay? So what's the market cap? What's the value of the stock price times the outstanding shares? Plus, you're going to have to pay a premium if you bought the whole company. So what's the typical premium on this? And you add it all up, and it might be undervalued co compared to all the other companies. And you find, OK, this one is good. It seems to be undervalued. We like the management team. We like their products. We like their profit margins. But for some reason, this one has been kicked down. And because of that, it actually is cheap relative to what it should be trading at. And now you got to move on to the next one. And sometime in the near future, there's some sort of catalyst that will allow the market to uncover this hidden value that it doesn't see today. Without the catalyst, you're just buying a cheap stock that's going nowhere, maybe even down. So, so again, a couple of people now are like, hey, FXCM is cheap. Should I buy it? I don't know. Are you a to are you an absolute total expert in the retail forex market? 
here in the United States, you know everything about everything, and then you've created valuation models for both gain capital and FXCM, and you, you know what those companies are worth based on, let's say, three years of uh, performa cash flow statements, and you've found out that the value of all of that is higher than the current net cap, and you see something in the next six to 12 months that, that should propel those stocks higher, and if the answer is yes to all of that, then yeah, maybe you should consider buying it. But you have to be smarter than everybody else because you've done the work. It's the same as Forex. You make your millions and your billions because you've done your homework, right? You want, you want to buy something cheap because it's cheap, right? What, do you, what does a, a, an amateur retail trader do? They buy the pound. Look how cheap the pound is. Okay, look, it's cheap. I wouldn't buy it. Let me remind you guys, we got to put all this in context. Sometimes I forget what we're talking about. I set you up short on this pair last May. 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 And then again in August. And then again in September. Look at the trade plans. Look at down, up, down, up, down. In the context of a larger up and down. We're already short the pound, guys. It's not magic. It's, it's not mystical. There's no crystal ball. And we have gone through it 25 times, right? So how do you make your money in Forex? You need to be smarter than everybody else. Now, is it smarter like you have to have a higher IQ? No. You just have done your work. That's all. The little things I tell you to do, like spend 2,000 hours on the, on, on the various Federal Reserve websites. That's all. Well, but Wayne, that'll take me two years. Yeah, well, in two years, you'll be well on your way to becoming a huge success. What's the big deal? Some people go to, an, uh, go to school and get an MBA so that they can make $20,000 more a year. But their MBA, if they go to a good school, it costs them 50 grand. Good, you spent 50 grand. In two or three years, it will have been paid for. You'll have a better job and all that kind of stuff. Oh, you're going to have to work nights, right? Oh, you're going to have to work weekends. Oh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. But I have children. Boo-hoo. Oh, I have an eight or nine hour a day job. Oh, boo-hoo. Well, people still do it. Maybe it doesn't take them two years. Maybe it takes them four years. They're going through the executive MBA program. I've actually taught. At an F, uh, at a uh, executive MBA program, I taught them the and macroeconomics. Cool, it's hard work, guys. But who cares? People do it all the time. Successful people do it all the time. How about the teachers now? You have to have a PhD to teach a third grader in the United States. You make what? I don't know what a teacher makes. They don't drive Lexuses, right? Um, they make nothing. They have they have 19 years of education to teach a three-year-old or three-year third grader how to multiply, and they spent tons of money to do it and tons of time. All I'm asking you is to fall in love with what you do in forex. Just be completely passionate about it. And stop chasing, you know, oscillator crosses and ADX moves and, and, and you know, I'm going to make nine pips on this one and 14 on that one. When we can line this up months in advance, set it all up, draw it all out, talk about it day after day, week after week, month after month. And it it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? 
So how do you make it? It's the same thing. How do you become a billionaire trading stock? Well, I just gave you the advice of how a billionaire became a billionaire many times over. He's got billions to give away. How did this person make billions? First of all, he's smarter than everybody else. But it's not like he has five PhDs. I've actually met people with multiple PhDs. I'm like, really? You should get a job, dude. No, what he does is hard work. I'll give you another example. Have you guys read the Market Wizards um, series of books? Yeah, there, a lot of people have. They're, they're fascinating. Not, they're not, it won't help you become a better trader, but it is fascinating. They are old, too, so the, the, some of the info is out of date, but it, it's interesting nonetheless. And there was one that, where the author, uh, Schwagger, contacted this. Uh, he was referred from, from a, I think, another market wizard guy recommended this other trader. So he calls up the trader says, hey, I'm writing a book on, on Market Wizards. Um, uh, can I interview you? And the guy's like, no. <laughs> so Jack Swagger follows up two or three more times. Come on, man. You know, I know all your friends. They, they, everyone says I should talk to you. Uh, I just want to interview you about what you do and all that kind of stuff. And the guy's like, all right, fine. Swing by my office after the market closes. And we, we can talk for an hour or so. Um, but... If you don't mind, and you have to agree to this, right? While you're asking me questions, I'm going to be doing my spreadsheets. I'm going to be doing my homework. You have to be okay with that. Just no disrespect. It has to get done. So they get there, and he's doing the interview. And sure enough, the, the guy's doing the spreadsheets while he's answering the questions. And finally, Jack Swagger says, well, what is it that you're doing? And he says, well... I found early in my career that if I do my homework every single day before I leave the office, then I can think about it at night when I'm home. I can dream about it when I'm sleeping. And when I show up to work the next day, I already know what I'm going to do, and then I do it. And I've been doing this for 25 years, and I know if I don't do it, I lose money. If I simply do my work, I make money money and nothing will stop me from doing my work James you, how do you how do you on a daily basis okay how do on a daily basis so you're only looking at the 15 minute chart okay how do you know what it's going to do today? Because that's all we have to do, right? You do. Absolutely, totally do. That's our job. That's it. Here's what Forex is. You have to know everything and you have to accurately predict, accurately predict the future every single day. So how do you do that? And he, this, this is the same advice every single day for 10 years that I've given. You start with macroeconomics, right? So fundamental analysis and or long-term technical analysis. And you trade in that direction. If you're in a downtrend, guess what? The odds are it's going to fall. That's where you make your money. So going back to that British pound, oh, so look at look at these charts, guys. You you forget. Look at. I drew this out for you days ago, days ago. Actually, this is last week. Right? Right, but you still... No, no, okay, yeah, maybe it's my tone of voice, but um, I am just trying to get something across, James. I'm not... Okay, but I'm saying 
the, where you make your money is not chasing price around, chasing oscillators around, chasing MACD around, chasing the ADX around, chasing the, you, you know, you're always going to be lagging because you're, la you're, you're lagging as a trader, relying on lagging indicators. What all I'm asking people do is think a little ahead so that you have a plan, so that you're waiting for your plan to execute. You're, al you're always three or four candles ahead, always. Whether it's three or four 15-minute candles or three or four daily candles, it doesn't matter to me, but you're always ahead. And how are you always ahead? You're always doing your homework. You're always doing your study, and you're always doing your analysis. You're always paying it, but you always have a trade plan set in front of the market. So, like in these certain scenarios that I've drawn, I said, "Well, okay, are we bearish or bullish? We're bearish. Good. So let's find levels of resistance in which we might want to sell, and then we sit and wait for reversal patterns, and then we short. So this made a lower low. Okay, it's going to come up, make a lower high, and then it's going to make another lower low. Easy." Right? But that comes from homework. And a lot of people are like confused by it. Now, check this out. I published a book, what, six or seven years ago, which means I wrote it eight years ago. Eight years ago. Amazing, right? In the book, Strategic and Tactical Forex Trading, it says if the top of the week is M3, which happens to be there, the market's going to go down to M1, which is actually there. Amazing, isn't it? So if, if it was true eight years ago, and it's true this week, Maybe it's repeatable. Maybe it's learnable. And this is what's most important, right? Because I never want to come across like, hi, my name is Wayne McDonald. I'm a genius. I mean, that's stupid. What I, I'm always drilling this home, and sometimes I, you hear my voice, maybe I get passionate. Sometimes I get angry because I want you to be more successful faster. But I can't do it for you. I can only beg and plead and push and slap and scream and cry to try to get people to make a change. It's a very difficult thing. It's a very difficult thing to go through as a trader, right? So, uh, you know, it, we got to keep pushing. But if you can see it like this, then what I want you to walk away with is it is repeatable. And if it's repeatable, it's teachable, which I'm doing, and if it's teachable, it's learnable, and if it's learnable, I don't know, maybe it can be profitable. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're all trying for, right? But what is the common thread now with using migration patterns of African elephants? Is it truly the elephant? Right? Is it really the elephant that's smarter than everybody else? Well, maybe. They actually know there's going to be a drought. But how do you, you know, how do you make money on that knowledge? Well, actually, like I said, I sit down with my children, my young children, sit down and say, there's a shortage, uh, uh, that so, there, there was a, something went wrong in the chicken population. Only chickens that lay eggs, not the ones we eat, only the ones lay eggs, Millions of them had to be killed to prevent a terrible disease. How do we make money on it? This is a conversation I have with my young children. And it's the same thing, like, there, there's a drought in Africa. How, there's a cause. What's the effect? How can I get in on it before everybody else? How can I pay attention to this? It's the homework. How does the billionaire become a billionaire from picking stock? Just picking stocks. Maybe the, the luckiest person on earth has been lucky for 30 years in a row. Maybe it's the work. Right? You see what I mean? How about the other guy that, uh, you know, a market wizard 25 years ago that was seriously successful? 
What made them successful? The work, according to that person. The only thing that keeps it going is the work. Knowing what to do before you've done it. And it's the same thing I've been saying for 10 years, right? We've got to have a plan. What's the plan? Can you go through the, the process in your mind? What do, WWWD, what, did, what would Wayne do? Open up the chart. And what would Wayne do? He, the first thing Wayne would say, what's your bias? Are you a bull or a bear? If you can't answer that, forget it. I don't get interested in any, anything else you have to say. Oh, but, oh, but, but, oh, but if I, it, uh, just, I don't, I don't care anymore. What's your bias? I don't have a bias. Well, good. Done. You know, I've mentored people over the, over the years, lots of people, in fact, not a lot of, not really a lot over the years, but you know, whatever. I, I've met a lot of traders, let's say, that are struggling. They, they come to me and they're like, Wayne, I'm struggling, I, and I need your help. I need you to, to help me become a better trader. I say, good. What's your bias? Oh, I don't have a bias. Well, there's your problem. <laughs> well, there it is. Right? Wayne, solve my problem. Help me out here. What's your bias? I don't have a bias. All right, give me $5,000. I just solved your problem. Hey, Wayne, I'm having a lot of trouble with this trade plan didn't execute. Well, what's your plan? Well, you know, show me your plan. We need the plan. We need the research. We need the knowledge. Because if you're a bear on Euro, it's going to be a lot easier because you're limiting yourself to selling the euro at resistance. Ideally when it's overbought, ideally when you're getting reversal patterns. That is not complicated, is it? Okay? Yeah. So that's why we you got to grasp that. Okay? So again, going back to that pound dollar. Pound dollar fell a lot today. <whistles> really? That That's see the thing is it shouldn't be news. Uh, where's the other chart? Come on, Kiwi. No, no wonder. I don't have it here. Where is it? Is it on this one? But anyways, if it's if it leads to success for other people. It's not even my advice or opinion anymore. It's just people that I listen to. And they say virtually the same thing, is that they have a bias, they have an opinion, based on facts and research, and then they trade in that direction. And that's all I want from, for you, and from you, really. So I want you to have an opinion based on research. I don't even care what the opinion is. I could totally disagree with you. We'll probably both, still both make money. And if I'm wrong, you'll make more money than me. Right? I'll make more money than you, but we could probably still both make it if you manage the risk properly and you time things. Because if I buy at support, it's still going to go up. It's support. It just not go up much if, it, if the market's bearish. So that's why I want you passionate and fall in love with just do some long-term analysis on your charts. Maybe take the fundamentals course. It's, it, it doesn't cover everything. It, it's a good start. And just say, you know, this is worth the fight. This is worth the effort. Hey, some people spend two or three or four years doing MBAs in the, in the evening, and they still raise their children, and they still have a job. And I mean, you can do this, man. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm sorry. I, I need to figure out. I think there's an update for me to fix that, Ron. Don't worry, I'll give you 
all the time in the world. Yeah. So, um, but that's what I think is going to lead you to success, guys, is, is a passion for being a currency trader. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's some sort of setting somewhere that needs to be programmed out, so I'm getting that done. So really, there doesn't need to be... Yeah, but I'm not purposely limiting to 60 days. I'll make it much longer than that. Okay, so let's go through some more trades, I suppose. But... Um, and I wish I had that chart. Where is that pound dollar chart? Um, you know, it, it must be. Uh, is it on this one? Mm, that's pound yen. But anyways, we have had it planned out for a very, very, very long time. Now, I think, to me, that's the most interesting thing. And then let it run, if you can, guys. Is it here? Yeah. Okay, remember the giant context of everything is this. Right? Down, 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 up, up to the 50% rollover. Okay. Oh, uh, USD yen, sure. Ooh, my Aussie took off again. Nice. Get up there, Aussie. All right, uh, here's the yen. In fact, what are the... 110 on Aussie yen, 125 on euro dollar. Cool. Yeah, let's do USD yen. Is that right, Joseph? Yeah, 700 pips. That's a nice one. Yeah, last year it was pretty easy. Remember, we used to sing these songs, right? Wake up in the morning and it's quarter to two. What do you do? You sell the euro. You sell the euro. <laughs> we used to like laugh. It was so easy. And just there was that was the strategy. You wake up in the morning, quarter to two. What do you do? You sell the euro. I mean, <laughs> that's it. It was that easy. Yeah, it only dropped 4,000 pips. Um, obviously, not that easy this year, but we are in a transitionary period amongst central banking policies. All right, so USD yen. Uh, yeah, all right, so... Um, let's move it out to a daily chart. Um, what's the analysis that I already have drawn? You know what? Let me kill the weekly pivots for you. Um, indicator list. Uh, I'll leave the fibs on, but I'll kill the weeklies. All right. All right. So what trade plan do I already have set up for us?
So it looks like I have us going up through 122 to maybe 123. But we need a break. I don't think we'll get a clear break. So we're probably still in this period, actually. Because you can see I have this going up to 23 and then coming down. Or 22, I should say. So we're kind of in that zone. Okay. Breakout, retracement, back to the roll reversal, and then up. Okay. Yeah, this is going to be interesting. Now, one of the talks that we had was that you know, when this was down at 20, we could be facing this idea of being at 125 at the end of the year, and you never saw it happen. Right? So we're our bottom here at nineteen, um, you know, it's we're at twenty two, that's three hundred pips ago already. Now was it was it the twentieth that we were waiting for the Bank of Japan? I've forgotten now the dates. Was it the 20th or was it the 30th? No, the 30th. The other one was like the 4th of October or something. Yeah. All right, so. I was trying to see what the timing of this was. So on your four-hour chart, though, can you see some of the value of... of um, well, let's talk about this. Um, the most important thing, first and foremost, is you find yourself at support. Okay? Whatever you identify support as being. Maybe you have this level as a secondary support and this is primary, whatever. That's fine. So that's the most important thing. If you're a bull and you're at support, Okay? That's, that's all I care about at this point. In a scenario like that, you can then, so remember it's if then, not anything else. If you're at support and you're a bull, all right, then if you find the oscillator oversold, you could buy it. Okay? Two of the biggest ones are here. Now, is every oscillator cross the same? Absolutely not. Okay. The oscillator crosses are important if you're at support. You're over, imagine the context here. If you're a bull and price has fallen down to support and it's oversold trying to rise back up, then you could have an opportunity to buy You can see there's a lot of mediocre moves here. Oh, you could still make some money, right? You're still, you could still do it. It just didn't go anywhere. Okay. How about these touches here? Near support, but not oversold. Okay. These, right? At support again, but not oversold. Okay. And maybe if you're considering this high level now support, you could be setting those up, okay? 
And then at some point, maybe this is support again. In the, in the future, we'll have to see. But none of that makes sense to me unless you have a bias. That's why I say, like, you have, you just, you have to have a bias. And like, uh, and I've asked you to specialize. Um, you know, Marina says she's doing quite well recently, and and all Marina does is trade the British pound. That's all I'm asking you to do. M master something, right? Yens, what if all you did was sell the Japanese yen? Well, you'd be praying for additional quantitative easing or improving global macroeconomics, but you'd, you would know what you're waiting for. Someone would say, well, what are you waiting for? I'm waiting for improving global macroeconomics and further quantitative easing out of the Bank of Japan. Both of those would help my situation. It's good to know. It's good to have malice of forethought. <laughs> Thinking ahead, right? So I'm going to do non-farm payrolls number 114. Um, would you like to join me? And remember, I think a, a good non-farm payrolls, whatever that is, it's up to the market, not to me, if it's a good non-farm payrolls, traders are going to say, aha, the Fed has to raise interest rates now. OK? And that could be really good for the dollar. I just happen to be a long dollar right now, so I'm okay with that. And uh, so here's the page. And 620 people have registered. Cool. Yeah, you would expect, but remember, Joseph, it's not my opinion. It's the market, um, market's opinion. I would like to see higher than that, but that would be surprising. But that would be what we want, right? Right on, guys. I thank, I thank you for that. So I'll be there tomorrow, and I hope you're going to be there. And I'd like to thank Forex uh, today for hosting us, and. and uh, I invite you to become a client of tradersway.com and uh, maybe we can continue trading day after day, month after month. How about year after year? Peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May our profits be above average. Cheers. Cheers.